Hey, what's up, everybody? My name is One Peg, sitting here in my new uh, Sleep Token t-shirt merch. If you guys don't listen to Sleep Token, you need to. They're freaking amazing. Um, anyway, my name is One Peg, and in this video, we're going to be talking about the dev Q&A for all things related to Dark and Darker and the playtest that begins on February 6th at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, I actually did not ask how long the playtest was going to last for, but it is part of Steam's Valve's Next Fest throughout Steam. So I guess it's going to last as long as the festival lasts. This is going to be a playable demo of the game, and that is categorically different than the playtest that we have been playing in, in only that it's going to be a separate download. So in order to be able to get the demo, you have to actually go to the Steam page, the store page for Dark and Darker, and opt in to download the demo of the game, not the playtest. So if you have saved the playtest or whatever on your computer already, it's not going to just automatically update because it's going to be a different line item in your game's library. OK, for those of you looking for a TLDR, because this took about an hour and a half. And again, thank you very, very much to Terry for sitting down with me. We do these uh, before every play test, which has been awesome. Uh, they've been really great conversations. And another very big thank you to Sacriel, who joined me for this as well. You're the man, dude. Thank you so much for uh, for bringing your insight and adding things to the conversation that I did not think of. Thank you. Thank you very much. This Q&A took about an hour and 20 minutes. I'm going to try to condense this into just a handful of minutes to make it easier for those of you that want a TLDR and don't actually care about like game related mechanics and stuff that has changed on the intricacy side of things. Uh, the big TLDRs are instead of there being a B1 dungeon for this play test, they're still working on B1, which is the first level. We go in on level two and then play to level three. For those of you that don't know, the B1 level is not ready yet. They're still working on it. But instead, what they did add as a very large experimental option is a separate solo player dungeon. So it's not going to be the same levels that we've been seeing on the group side of things where you can have up to three players. It's going to be a completely separate, like single level dungeon with a troll boss at the end, a cave troll boss at the end with a big old club that uh, is going to present to be pretty challenging and will have up to epic quality loot currently, possibly could end up being retweaked to allow for legendary quality loot to drop. So that pretty cool. The second big thing is voice over IP will be in this playtest. The next playtest will have in-game VoIP. There will be team VoIP where you're only talking to teammates and proximity VoIP where you are talking to everyone. Obviously, this also is experimental and could also be changed, so we will see. Also, there will be a toggle option to be able to turn VoIP on and off just in case people around you decide that they're going to be a little spicy. There is also going to be the introduction of a karma system where if you team kill your your buddies too many times, like for matchmaking and pick up groups with other random people in the game, if you team kill them, you will end up getting progressively worse karma and eventually your name will end up having a red nameplate, which will denote to other people that you probably can't be trusted. Last but certainly not least, there was a bard class that had been talked about uh, in several of these interviews in the past. The bard is not yet ready, will not be in this playtest, maybe for the next one. Uh, Terry was kind of chuckling back and forth about how he tended to like get ahead of himself. Now, there was a lot more in here, so I'm going to get to the other bullet points, and I'm just going to go through chronological order, not only to make it easier on me looking through the notes, but also to make it easier on my editor. Saint, good job, bro. So for the purpose of this, like I said, it's going into a demo and the idea behind what they've been working on outside of holiday hours and whatnot and will be working on for the remainder of this week until the playtest actually begins was quality of life stuff for onboarding new players. So they wanted to make the interface a little bit more user friendly and obviously make the um, the starting sequences to get yourself up and going a little bit more user friendly as well. Terry believed that the playtest from the prior playtest, the things that went well were the introduction of skins, you know, that seemed like it really went well with the player base. Uh, the initial balancing of classes once we kind of got going with making spells more or less expensive and then working through different power curves, you know, buffing or nerfing certain aspects of each of the characters to make them a little bit more balanced and not necessarily as broken. There was also some discussions about the wizard class and eventually maybe we get a sorcerer of some kind where the sorcerer has like more innate like magical power but doesn't have as much learning as the wizard does, where a wizard is much more learned and understands more spells, has a more diverse library of, of things that they can do. But in far, insofar as reworking the wizard class to make them a little bit less powerful, um, for those of you that don't know, know and you want to know how to play a wizard, come by the stream, I'll show you what they're all about. Uh, the wizard class has not yet been tweaked. 
They have looked at some stat allocation changes with allowing them to have a little bit more knowledge so that they can uh, memorize a bit more in terms of what spells they, they can carry and the, the library of spells that they're able to hold on to. So I would look at likely seeing them have a little bit more uh, spell opportunity when they don't have any gear on, when they're, when they're low geared. Uh, and the cleric also was, believe it or not, they had one less point than every other class. Every class was allocated 75 stat points in their base class like stat allocations, but for whatever reason, the cleric was only given 74. They lacked one point of agility, so the cleric now has that point of agility back. As I said at the start, we are going to get a troll boss. And the idea behind the troll boss is it's going to be a much more rewarding, uh, I guess, combat loop if you are getting into melee range as opposed to staying much more uh, further away and trying to kite them. Terry's critique of the gameplay loop for some of the classes is it seemed as though ranged classes had a little bit more of an easy time in PvE because most of the enemies that you end up fighting are melee based. Uh, there aren't very many that are ranged based. So there's going to be it sounds like some type of mechanic with the troll boss that's going to make you want to get up in his face as opposed to trying to fight him from far away now there had been some criticism about this troll boss and their uh their artwork the 3d model of the troll boss which believe it or not is an asset that was obtained from the unreal engine marketplace so the, the troll is a prefabricated, I guess, entity. The idea here, though, and Terry kind of backed this up, is by saying they only have 22 developers that are hands on keyboard and they only employ one 3D modeler. So when it comes to mechanics and trying to bring content to everyone, in, in a lot of cases, they have to go to a marketplace and, you know, get some prefabbed assets. In this case, though, what they're trying to do is make it a little bit more personalized once they have the asset and work on customizing them as time goes on. So right now, for people that are just really well versed or understand Unreal and how it's built and, you know, buying prefab assets, it might end up looking like it's a little more inexpensive to do that. And you'd be right. It is. It's cost effective. It's a cost effective way for them to be able to generate this. And it allows us to be able to get additional content in uh, a shorter time frame using less hands on than what you would need in order to be able to build your own stuff from the ground up, which obviously takes considerably more time. Now, once again, as a reminder, February 6th at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, which is Monday, is when the playtest starts. The demo files will be released six hours in advance of that. So approximately six hours. So six hours in advance of the demo beginning, you should be able to preload those files and then everything kicks off at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, which for those of you that are looking at it, it would be 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time or 6 p.m. GMT, I think. I don't know. Daylight savings always messes me up. It's either minus five or minus six. Whichever, whichever one it is right now. I think it's, I think that's right, though. I think those times are right. At one point, we ended up joking with Terry about how they were going to sell a ton of copies. We were like, yeah, Zachary and I both agreed that at some point in the next calendar year, they're going to sell like 2 million copies of this game. There's going to be 2 million units sold. And uh, Terry said if they sold 2 million units, they would tweet a personal thanks to us for uh, predicting it, <laughs> which I thought was funny. Insofar as early access release, quality of life being what it is, uh, what Terry said was if the quality of life changes that they they've made so far into meeting the expectations of players for this playtest, then what they're going to do is focus on making more content, obviously work on the content build for B1, the first level of the team sided dungeon specifically, and they're still targeting Q2 of this year for early access, which would be the end of April and if not the beginning of May. When we started talking about B1, one of the questions that I've had all along and that Sacriel has kind of been rallying for is whether or not B1 will start outdoors. See, there's this, this video vision that we both kind of share about uh, you leave the tavern and you're kind of like in this dark forested area and whatnot, maybe working your way into some castle ruins, let's say, and then end up going into like basement two of the dungeon level where it's actually like underground and there's like this dungeon dungeon. So my question to Terry in this case was whether or not we're going to see the sky. Terry said it was actually kind of funny at this point. He kind of, he, he ended up laughing about this because these types of discussions are the same discussions that they have internally. Uh, he said that it may not and will likely not be early access where we start outside, but what they want to do is maybe give us like some, some, you know, cracks or holes or something in the, the ceiling to be able to see like light shafts or something from the outdoors kind of shining in through uh, the exterior of the structure that we're in, which I think would be a really cool start. Uh, 
eventually he said that what they want to do is make that vision come true where you are starting in more of an outdoorsy type of situation. From here I move the conversation into uh, weapon and armor mechanics. So in terms of like shields and blocking angles and whatnot, what Terry said is when you go to block with a shield there are uh, a number of tracers that follow your hand all the way up through the, the shaft and then ultimately the blade of whatever weapon it is that you're wielding at the time, staff or whatnot. Throughout that swing, if the shield is able to block all of those tracers, then obviously you don't take any damage. Where the damage comes into play can be as a result of, of tick rate having problems when those swings occur and also can be whether or not uh, like you get knocked over the top of your shield and like the blade hits your head let's say for instance you end up taking a headshot from that he said that they haven't tweaked this yet and the blocking angles are very precise he kept using the words precise in this case where the the blocking the hit boxes that are set up to block those attacks are needed to be placed in a very specific position in order to be able to block some of the attacks that come in. He's going to, or they will be looking at whether or not that precision is like too precise or if they can tweak it into something that seems like a little bit more broad and make it feel a little bit more visceral. He also said that a problem the player base experiences in this case is because of the first person camera. Because when you take a shield and you put it up in front of your face, like all you're seeing is the shield up in front of your face instead of being potentially able to see where that strike is coming from. Because the camera angles are so tight, in a lot of cases you think you're blocking but you don't actually have the angle right. And he said if we were able to take a camera and put it like over your shoulder, you'd probably be able to track that a whole lot better and would block a whole lot more often. So again, it's just something that they have to look at and tweak more. Again, on the weapon side of things, I asked about two-handed mauls just because I'm, I'm a selfish cleric. Uh, and I want to see if they could give us some type of overhead strike which they had done with the morning star uh he had said that this has become more of like a meme weapon almost and is really good for content for people that aren't paying attention to how those swings work and in a lot of cases those wide arcing swings end up accidentally hitting and team killing some of your teammates which ends up being really funny so i anticipate that something like a war mall will end up working out pretty well in maybe like a solo dungeon kind of situation uh also for those of you that are wondering they have buffed the run speed availability for players that are using two-handed weapons now, so you won't be nearly as slow when you are in heavy armor holding a two-handed weapon. The speed penalties have been reduced. So hopefully for using a war mall, maybe in a solo dungeon, if you're making those wide arcing swings using like a drunken master build for a cleric, it might be a little bit better in that case or a little bit more usable, but in the group setting, I think it's still pretty dangerous. But no word, they have not decided that they're going to change that in any way as of yet. In terms of gold storage, they haven't touched the gold storage side of this at all. They have already modeled out like storage containers and whatnot that you could put into your stash to be able to hoard more gear or hoard more gold. Um, they also toyed with the idea of increasing the size of or the amount of gold that each bag would hold. In this case, though, they are not touching this at this time. They think it's a, an interesting dynamic where it makes the player base kind of think outside of the box in terms of what they're going to keep and what they're going to use and kind of for forces people to have to use what they've accumulated in order to be able to keep going. He thinks that the potential likelihood of adding storage boxes could end up turning people more into hoarders, and uh, that's not really what the intention is. Um, if you're going to use powerful stuff, use powerful stuff. A backup set, maybe two, you know, whatever. But this also keeps the player base, if they end up having a really bad run or series of runs, going back into the normal size dungeons or the normal level difficulty dungeons to try and accumulate more gear and keeps the gameplay loop, uh, I guess, alive for players that are just starting out along with all of the veterans. So I think I get the logic there. Also put on hold is the idea of a shared stash. I know a lot of people wanted the ability to be able to like trade with themselves and share gear between alternate playing accounts and whatnot, but in this case, a lot of alts are still doing an awful lot of gold hoarding by just moving gear between uh, one character to another through a friend or whatever, um, and it's still happening. In this way, if they use a shared stash by hoarding it through a, a shared stash system, it just kind of keeps the alts rich. Again, the idea here is that they're trying to make sure that people sort of kind of remain on the struggle bus and play through the actual game as opposed to getting so far ahead of the game that they turn into hoarders and they have just tons of stuff and they never have to worry about plebbing it again. As I already mentioned at the start, voice over IP will be enabled for this playtest. Everybody scream. <laughs> 
Uh, if you don't want to have VoIP in your game and you don't want to have to listen to people in proximity or whatever, uh, you can toggle it off if you want to. You don't have to leave it on. Uh, so you can you can turn it off in case you know people are going to be spicy. Um, there is also the option to be able to switch it between team chat and uh, proximity voice chat. So there's that. The option to be able to use VoIP during stealth is also there. So if you stealth and you want to use VoIP, it should work according to Terry. We will see if it does. Again, the Bard class will not be included in this playtest. Maybe next time, hopefully next time. You know, everybody just breathe deep, just huff the copium, just, okay, all right. Also in this playtest is going to be a matchmaking system. There's going to be a pool of players that you'll be able to choose from, people that are looking for group, and you can invite them into your group should you so choose. The invite system is going to be based on region, so depending on the server regions that you select, you'll be able to invite people from each one of those pools. That way, you're obviously playing with people that are relatively close to you, and you're not going to have to worry about ping limitations or, like, laggy issues, you know, those kinds of things. In addition to that, this is all also going to come with a karma system that is going to be based around whether or not players team kill their teammates from this matchmaking. So if you are somebody that ends up team killing people with reckless abandon and you just want to be that bandito style of game player, so be it. If that's how you're going to run, just know that at some point, likely it won't take very long, uh, your name will turn red and you will probably not be invited to any parties anymore. <laughs> I just have this vision of like two rogues inviting like some poor lowly fighter or wizard or something and then it's as soon as the match starts, both of the rogues just go invisible, and the dude's like, guys? Guys? And then you know what happens after that, you know? In terms of being able to protect your gear in case, uh, you know, team killers end up doing, you know, what you would rather not have them do to you, do to you, uh, and loot all of your stuff, in order to protect yourself, uh, there was a suggestion that Sacriel had made about potentially uh, protecting your gear against, you know, team kills, uh, in, where you would have to, like, say, like, yeah, it's cool, like, take my stuff or don't. But Terry said, uh, that's not really what we want for Dark and Darker. We want this to feel like it can be cutthroat and not have people be, of, like necessarily afraid of playing in a reckless or chaotic way, but have consequences for your actions instead, which I like. I think that's cool. Getting down to the last few questions, uh, I asked about bulk buying and selling items. The idea of bulk buy and sell, if you've ever tried to sell like a huge stack of silver coins, for instance, has always been a pain in the butt because you have to do it like three coins at a time and keep clicking buttons back and forth. Uh, he said that this is actually a difficult problem to handle at the moment because of, you know, UI interactions, whatever. So what they've done is they They've instead uh, given us like stack options. So instead of selling or buying like one coin at a time, one gold coin for three silver, you could buy three gold coins or five or 10 or whatever there is that's available and buy them in chunks rather than buying them one at a time. So for the the ruby mining in game, we had that mining system that was added. And if anybody had tried that, you uh, amass like a whole bunch of this ruby ore, and then that would get turned into ingots. And then the ingots eventually would get turned into uh, wearable items. Unfortunately, that seemed like it was a huge grind. Uh, the ratios of stuff that you had to collect in order to be able to make some of those armor items, those armor pieces, was just really, really time consuming and cost a lot of resources. Uh, I asked about that. They said that this has been adjusted and he believes that they slashed the requirements for like making all this armor and stuff in half. So for those of you that are much more on the gathering side of things, this should be a little bit more friendly to you. Uh, I'm going to go and try it obviously myself to see how this goes and see how long it takes to be able to make some things. Um, get a good idea of how long it actually takes to grind this out and then try to feed that back and see what we think. Um, it might still be too long, but we will see. The last question was about quests, whether or not we would have them at this point in the development cycle. And Terry said, unfortunately not. They haven't had enough time to be able to add them yet. But next play test, there's going to be a pretty big focus on the questing system and adding those and, you know, trying to see what people think about having done them. Oh, and uh, last but not least, there was also mention of the market, the marketplace. So right now, when you go into the market and you want to like buy an item there's just tons and tons of scrolling words and terry remarked it as being akin to like the matrix right like seeing like all the little like figures like flying <laughs> like floating through the the screen um some people are really good at catching items and like trying to buy them and most people aren't because of how fast the chat scrolls so what they're working on is a more like a uh, flea market-esque like server hub where players can buy and sell and trade those items in a way that isn't going to be so scrolling uh but he didn't really elaborate on this 
he says it is an improvement though so hopefully we'll be able to check that out and see what that's like anyway guys uh that's what i have for this hopefully this was short and sweet thank you guys so much for coming and checking this video out if you would be so kind as to follow me on my socials at onepegmg on twitter at onepeg on tiktok i stream every day from 6 to 7 a.m eastern standard time at twitch.tv slash onepeg until whenever i will be no lifing the living hecking heck out of this game when dark and darker goes live so please come by the stream and check it out and as always if you would be kind enough to sub the channel here i would be incredibly incredibly never endingly appreciative i am what are we like 2500 subs away from 100,000 now it's so close this is ridiculous uh just thank you so much for lending me your eyeballs guys and i will see you in the next one peace <laughs>